been a while since I've done one of these Back to the 90s story times and I was recently inspired, unfortunately not for positive reasons, but inspired nonetheless by the passing of Daisy Berkowitz of Marilyn Manson. And a while back I told a story and there's a part two to that story and I figured that, hey, you know what, it'd be a good idea if I just told the story as a whole so that you can hear all of it. Marilyn Manson to a lot of us was really a gateway drug into the gothic subculture. I know for myself, I know for my friends, and a lot of people that I've spoken to have all really said the same thing. When you're an alternatine, and back in the 90s, we had this term called alternatine, and that was when you were really, you were not really somebody distinguishable in any sort of subculture itself. Like you were, you a punk, you weren't a goth, you weren't really industrial, what the hell were you? You were basically in a phase where you knew that you didn't like anything that the mainstream had to offer. You didn't like the clothes, you didn't like the music, you didn't like everything that the masses were into. You just knew that you liked everything that was different, things that were out of the norm. And that was where you were just freaking dipping your foot into a little bit of everything to really find who you were. And Marilyn Manson kind of bridged that gap between alternatine and goth for a lot of us. So something crazy happened. Marilyn Manson was coming to town, not only coming to New York, but coming to a venue that was 20 minutes from our house, that never ever happens. So the fact that we're ages 14 to 16 made it very difficult to be able to go to any shows in general, really do much of anything unless the parental units approved. And if the show had been in Manhattan, there's no way we would have been able to attend, but it made it far more likely considering it was 20 minutes from our house. So we told the parents, we begged, we pleaded, and their main concern was the fact that this was an all-ages event and they didn't feel um, comfortable that we would be as 14 to 16 year olds in the same room as people in the 20s, 30s, 40s, etc. So it made them a little bit uneasy. So they came to a compromise where they said, okay, you can go to the show, but you need a chaperone. So one of the parents were going to have to stand to the task. I wasn't I wasn't surprised that my father stood the task. What I was surprised about is the fact that they let him do it because my father was, um, he was a partier and he was a partier back in his day, but it's something that he took with him to the present. It's something that he never stopped and he wasn't exactly the most responsible human being. In fact, um, he did more drugs than anybody that I'd ever known and um, small little detail I'll probably get into at some point in uh, the future, uh, he died of a drug overdose in 2000. So they let him take us to the show, but I wasn't gonna say anything, even though I knew it was the worst idea. And I didn't want anything to really stand in the way of us getting to see the show. And he was a liability, but he was our only chance. So kept it shut. <sighs> we arrive and the very first thing that I see to my right is a fully stocked bar. Not exactly the best fucking plan at an all-ages event, but it was there nonetheless. And of course, the very first thing my father makes a beeline toward. Not before remarking on the guy wearing the black and white striped tights and extending his condolences for somebody dropping a house on his sister. You totally won't get the reference if you haven't seen The Wizard of Oz. So we see that my father is pounding drinks at the bar and be it strategic planning or just our adventurous nature, we decide that we're gonna distance ourselves as much as humanly possible from my father and just sort of wander around. And we see a lot of people already there that we knew. So I meet up with my friend, Matt Miniachi, who I lovingly refer to as Matt Minacrachi, who happens to be one of the sweetest, most laid back, calm people you will ever meet. But he's also the guy that you want to be hanging out with if you want to meet the band. We don't know how, but he's just one of those people that have this incredible luck that he will be taking pictures with bands, he will go out to breakfast with these bands. We don't know how it happens, it just happens. But this was still very early in the stage of the game. We were really young, so he was just sort of developing his superpowers. And we decide, hey, let's go around by the bathrooms because for some reason, people always hung around by the bathrooms. I have no idea why. We go around and it's like around the back of the stage and we go around by the bathrooms and I'm looking to the doors on my left, which is where the bathrooms are. But I really should have been looking to my right because I didn't realize it. Those were the dressing rooms. And as we walk past a doorway, I hear Matt go, oh, hey, Twiggy, how's it going? I turn and look and there's Twiggy stood right there in front of an open doorway. I look just beyond Twiggy in this open doorway and there's Marilyn Manson sitting in a wooden chair going like this, lifting imaginary weights. 
Why? I have no idea. He's just doing that, looking up at us all menacingly. And this took all of probably a full minute, if that. But it seemed a lot longer. And Twiggy uh, decided he was going to exit the conversation, go back into the dressing room, but not before asking us both for a hug. So we gave him a hug. 15-year-old me is like, oh my god, this is crazy. But Matt's like, that was really interesting, huh? And I decide to adopt his very calm demeanor. And I'm like, yeah, you know what it was. <laughs> So this isn't a very long hallway, just at the end was probably a good 10 feet away, and we see that at the very end of the hallway is a drum kit, and sat on, well not a drum kit, I'm sorry, it's like a rolling drum case, and sat on top is Gingerfish. So we sort of communicated with each other by not saying anything that we are going to go say hello to Gingerfish, which we did. And I couldn't tell you what happened during that conversation, I couldn't tell you what we said, I don't even remember exiting the conversation, I just remember being there and then not being there. But the one thing that I do remember is pulling out my ticket stub and asking him to sign it, to which he pulled out a sharpie marker and he just drew sort of fishy on my ticket stub and I had it for years in a box that I had a lot of ticket stubs in and during one of my many moves unfortunately that box has, has been lost, but I'm hoping that one day it'll find its way back to me. Given how much that had actually taken place, you would think that it had taken place over several hours, but the truth of the matter was, we were only really in that club for like an hour and a half. While we're stood there, I'm told that um, my father was booted from the club for buying kids alcohol. Awesome. But I'm not going to let it ruin our night. He's booted from the club, but he finds his way back in. And he finds his way back in and makes his way toward the VIP area, which is where Van Bile happens to be hanging out, including one of the members by the name of Sin, who my father immediately, I guess, offends by hitting on. And I guess she's very uncomfortable, my father gets booted from the VIP area, and eventually just booted from the club in general because they remember, hey, this is the guy we kicked out for buying underage kids alcohol. So it's down to basically the wire. Marilyn and Manson are probably gonna take the stage in no more than 10 minutes, and my father makes his way back into the club. And this time, he's guarding a broom closet. And my friend Jen came and got me and said, oh my God, you'll never guess what your father's doing. I'm like, son of a bitch, what? So she pulls me over and sure enough, there he stood in front of a janitorial closet, very clearly. And he is stood there with his arms folded, eyes half open. He's like, you can't go in there. And I'm like, dad, I don't want to go in there. That's a fucking broom closet. It was inevitable. None of us felt safe driving home with him. We knew it was an unsafe situation because he was completely incapacitated. He was unable to drive us home safely. And we wanted to just make the best out of a bad situation. So as a group collectively, we decided that my at the time boyfriend, Ed, was gonna call his parents from the payphone and explain the situation and have them come pick us up. But we at least wanted to see one Marilyn Manson song before that happened. So we were gonna wait it out. And during that time, my, at the time, boyfriend Ed had come up to me and said, oh my God, you'll never guess what happened. I knew it happened. My father got kicked out of the club because that was sort of the theme of the evening. I was like, let me guess, my father got kicked out of the club. He said, yeah, but that's not the crazy part. So I should point out initially that it's winter time. It's freezing out. There's a sheet of ice and snow on the ground. He said, so they kick your father out of the club and he walks to the car completely fine on the snow and ice, but the second he steps onto solid ground, he fell. So we know it's minutes now that we have until the band's gonna take the stage. So we need to position ourselves in the crowd so we can get a good view. Now granted, it was a really small venue, so no matter where you stood, you'd get a good view, but we wanted like a super good view. So my friend Elena, she got right up against the barrier, front and center, and my friend Jen and I decided we were gonna be a little bit adventurous. We wanted to go and stand between the barrier and the stage where the security guards were. I don't know why we decided to do this, but the sick part is that they let us. So we were stood just between the amp and Twiggy. So at some point during the song, Marilyn Manson out of nowhere decides that he's gonna let his whole left nostril out on Elena's arm. And she stood just feet from us and we see her immediately look at us. And she's like, should I be excited? We're like, no, it's human snot, wipe it off. Nobody wanted to, but we knew we had no choice. It was at this point that, you know, Ed had to call his parents and come and pick us up. And, you know, here comes his mom and dad in the minivan, takes everybody home, and they decide that they want me to stay at their house that night because they didn't really feel comfortable given the condition my father was in. They didn't know if he was going to be mad at me or what would really happen, but they felt safer 
if I stayed at their house that night, which my friend stayed with me. So Jen and I stayed on the pullout sofa in their den and my mother came and picked us up in the morning and that was really it. So the next time we saw Marilyn Manson, we got to see the full show, uh, but we still had a liability with us, but this time in the form of our friend Eric, who was also nicknamed Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Manson was his mentor. And the funny thing about that was he would emulate a lot of his behaviors and one of those behaviors was something that he called tuck and hide, which is where he would pull his pants down to his ankles and tuck his penis between his legs as if he had a vagina. He did it at clubs, parties, didn't matter. We're there, we're at the show, we're with Eric, AKA Marilyn Manson. I don't know why I took that little sidestep, but we're there with uh, Marilyn Manson himself, Eric, and we know that we need to keep an eye on him because Eric is a little bit of a firecracker. Like once he gets loose, there's no telling what he's gonna do. And given the fact that he was gonna be at a heightened sense of excitement and arousal because his mentor would be right there, we knew that we really needed to keep tabs on him because we didn't want him to hurt somebody, hurt himself, get arrested, blow the place up. We had no idea. So um, my friends and I, we decided that the best place to watch the show were from the sidelines. So you had the crowd right in front of the show and then just around that was like a little walkway. And then there were these platforms where a lot of people were stood on. So you were up looking sort of above the crowd, but at the stage. That's where I chose to stand and I was standing with a couple of my friends. So there was a point during the show where Marilyn Manson was stood at this podium sort of preaching at the crowd. And then we look and we see like a little bit of a ruckus going on in the crowd and people are backing away. And for some reason we knew it was Eric. And we're standing on tiptoes looking and then we see Eric rise above the crowd. He's a little bit higher because he's tall as it is. And then he was standing on his bag, completely naked, doing tuck and hide, preaching back at Marilyn Manson. And we were like, oh my God, we gotta go get him. But none of us wanna touch him because he's naked. I don't remember how we got him out of there, but somehow we got him out of there before we all managed to get kicked out. And that was basically the end of the night. We went to a diner and, um, you know, discussed about how Eric got naked and he got naked again in the diner. I still very much credit Marilyn Manson with who I am today because, like I said, I was a cheesy alternatine that had no idea who I was. I probably looked like somebody who dipped themselves in glue and ran through every alternative person's closet at one point because I was still trying to find myself. I had no idea who I was, but you know, if it wasn't for Marilyn Manson really bridging that gap and helping me realize that sort of dark part of myself, I wouldn't have really discovered any of the other bands that got me into really where I am now. So that's my story.